How many of you remember Read My Lips, No New Taxes? <laughs> that was a long, long time ago, right? That was a promise that was made by the first President Bush, and it became uh, one of those things that became part of pop culture because he found out it was a promise that he couldn't keep. This week in Oakland, California, the Oakland A's baseball team played his last game in Oakland, in the city, after, after being in that city for almost 60 years. They're moving to Las Vegas. All of this in spite of the owner saying just a few years ago, we'll never move. Broken promises. Those are just a few instances where, in fact, there are many instances in which we see broken promises come across our screens. But when, it's in the, but when it's in our world, broken promises are devastating. Think of the broken promises and relationships and business in your life. We make life-changing decisions based on promises only to have those promises broken. Dreams are shattered. The life goes into a tailspin. And you and I know this terrible feeling all too well. Some of us cringe when we hear the words, I give you my word. How many of you take a step back when somebody tells you, I give you my word? Right? Or I swear on my mother's grave. It's another one. Right? We have PTSD moments triggered by those types of statements. Because those statements remind us of our heartbreak. Lack of trust. Lack of trust comes from broken promises, and lack of trust can be crippling in relationships. It can be crippling to family, crippling to organizations. And I don't know how many situations I've seen in just the past few months where I look at a situation and I understand that the reason that I'm looking at a toxic situation is because somewhere along the way, a promise or promises were broken. Lack of trust. Some of you are here this morning and it's against your better judgment because you've been in church and the church has broken its promises in your past. Whatever the reason at the heart of it all, being burned by church, a promise has been broken. Promises of love, promises of safety, promises of community, promises of friendship, all of that has been broken and broken promises. Today we continue our Bible binge and again, we find ourselves in the book of Jeremiah. This is our third uh, visit with Jeremiah, and we're wrapping up the book of Jeremiah. Like I said, we'll be in Ezekiel next week. Jeremiah, again, was one. He was a prophet, so he's God's spokesman for the nation. He speaks God's word. He was a prophet around what we know as 586 B.C., the destruction of Jerusalem. He saw Jerusalem uh, flattened. He saw the temple laid to waste. This book is a collection of prophetic clippings. Babylon has been the one. Babylon's the big baddie. Babylon is the one who has done all the destruction. And now, many of his friends, they are living in Babylon because they've been deported from Jerusalem. They are deported hundreds of miles from their home. And so he puts together this scrapbook, a collection of clippings from his various sermons and poems and his autobiographical notes. Jeremiah compiled all of these for decades of being God's prophet for the people. And they all want to know, he gets word back, he's in Jerusalem, he gets word back, they all want to know, why did this all happen? Why is Jerusalem smoking? <laughs> why is the temple no longer? Well, here's, here's my scrapbook. 
This is what I was saying was going to happen all along. You weren't listening. So in order to understand just what Jeremiah is saying, we have to understand how this scrapbook of clippings has been arranged. This book begins with, and it, most good, again, good authors, that very first chapter, they're telling you what's going to happen. They're setting the stage. That's exactly what Jeremiah 1 is doing. And Jeremiah 52, which is the last chapter, is kind of wrapping it all up. But thematically, the book spends most of its time talking about doom and gloom. God's judgment is coming, or God's judgment has come. Almost the entire book. In the middle, there are four chapters. Chapters 31 through 34 that are not doom and gloom. So at the front end, doom and gloom. Back end, doom and gloom. In the middle, you have four chapters that are absolutely bright and positive, brilliant, brimming with optimism. It is a super bright spot. And like I said earlier, it is so bright these chapters are among the most quoted in the New Testament when the, when the new church is trying to understand their place in history. Because Jeremiah is laying it all out. He's laying it all out in these chapters. So these four chapters then are answering another question that has come back to Jeremiah in Jerusalem. Think about it. This would be your question if you've been deported and you're living someplace that you feel like you don't belong. And that question is this, is this the end? Is this the end for Israel? I mean, again, you've seen your home burned and destroyed. You've been put on a camel or a wagon and you've been carted off, you've been deported. Is this the end. Is there no future for Israel? And if there's no future for Israel, is there any hope? Is there any hope for us? Have we blown it? If you're right, if all if, if we brought on ourselves, have we blown it for all time? Have we blown it for all time? It's a legitimate question. I mean, God is the one. I mean, He used Babylon, but you get the you, you get the you get the sense God saying through Jeremiah, "I'm the one who deported you." In fact, that shows up in this passage. I'm the one who deported you. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar and and, and the Babylonian army. Yeah, they're the ones that that did all the heavy lifting, but this is me. But if you've been deported hundreds of miles, you're thinking, man, I'd rather be dead. I'd rather be dead. Life has been one shock after another. But sitting underneath, is this the end? If you're someone who has been trying to keep track of things, both through the words of Jeremiah and all of the things that have gone on, all the stuff that you've heard in the Torah as you were growing up, and all those religious guys that you weren't listening to, then you begin to ask, you also ask the question, what of God's promises? What about God's promises? If this is the end, then how is God going to save face? How does God save face? Is God a liar? Or has he changed his mind on those promises? Again, God has promised. He promised Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Well, where is that promise now? He said, I'm going to make your nation as numerous as the stars. He tells David, I'm going to establish your throne forever. There's always going to be a king in Israel from David's line. Where is that promise now? And then the original promise. 
I will destroy the serpent once and for all. That promise given to our original parents, Adam and Eve. Uh, what about the promise? Is God a liar? Has he broken his promises? From the beginning, God has been a promise-making God. His promises are all over the Bible. Now, these promises, typically, in the, in the big places that we see, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, they're in the form of what we call covenant. Covenant. And people, people have been arguing for thousands of years, what does it mean when we start talking about covenant? And I know we've got our own ideas and understandings from, uh, here in our, with our American language as to what covenant means, and sometimes that becomes a problem. Because we now import what our dictionaries are telling us a covenant is, or, or, or our, our usage of it is. But if we allow the Bible to inform our understanding of covenant, this is generally what you get. Covenant is a divine arrangement. Again, it's a divine arrangement. God, it's God initiated. Nobody ever goes to try and bargain with God, right? <laughs> We're in no position to that. It's a divine arrangement between two parties involving a commitment with obligation. Now, there is so much more that could be said about covenant. That's just a, a very quick snapshot of what covenant is. And then here are the characteristics. And again, these characteristics are all over the Bible, and you find them in all sorts of different ways. And I'm summarizing for you, and yes, uh, it's, it's a bit of fine print here. And we're not going to go over all these characteristics, trust me. But I want you to see, when we're talking about covenant from the Bible, generally speaking, whether it's Noah, even Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, any of these covenants, you're going to have some or all of these characteristics. They are the terms of the relationship established between two parties, kind of like the covenants that we draw up, contracts. They involve the swearing of an oath. Okay, so there's a, there's a promise made. There are promise statements of loyalty and commitment. This is what I'm going to do. This is how faithful I'm going to be to whatever it is we're saying. And they are legal binding arrangements. There's some legal, there's a lot of legal terms that circle these covenants. They are a testament or will. That's also a biggie. When we think about testaments and wills, these are things that will happen once a party has died. <laughs> Which is why you see these always ratified in blood. And then number six, they are the administration of God's kingship over his people and all. You want to know what God expects of his people? You want to know how God is ruling and reigning over his people? Slip to the terms of the covenant. Okay? So those are the characteristics. Again, we're not going to get into all of those. That's for another time. And all of these are in play today in our story. But the people of Israel, in their grief, are asking, is there no future? Is there no future for us? Is it over for Israel? And that question is leaning into God's faithfulness, and it's leaning into general understanding of covenant. And these are all great questions. Is God going to be faithful to his covenants? There's a slight problem with this very legitimate question. Is God going to be faithful? What of God's promises? It comes into play in our text this morning. And here's how our section that we're looking at, it's a breathtaking section. This is how it starts. Look, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. This will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, my covenant, that they broke. Ah! Okay. So even as we're asking, is God, you know, what's going to happen to all of God's promises, we have to remind ourselves, Israel's going to have to remind themselves, they're the ones that broke covenant. They're the covenant breakers. Before we start, what about God and his promises? <laughs> we better own the fact that we are the ultimate covenant breakers. <laughs> yeah, he's saying there's going to be a new covenant, but the reason he's having to make a new covenant is because they broke the old one. And they did. In fact, he gives to Moses on the mountain. 
Moses isn't even on the mountain, and he's listening to all the joy and celebration going on in the camp below on the mountain. He comes down, he finds out they're worshiping a golden calf. They violated the covenant before he's even had a chance to speak it to them. And they've been doing this for centuries, chasing after other gods and other uh, loves and interests. They broke their word. In fact, this is what they say at Sinai. This is the statement that they make with Moses. They're all at the bottom of the mountain. This is centuries prior. They've just come through the Red Sea. And so they're standing along the, around this smoking mountain. And having heard God's words and God's promises, all the people responded together. I swear on my mother's grave. Right? We will do all that the Lord has spoken. We will do everything that the Lord has commanded. Eh? There you go. I promise you. I swear on my mother's grave. We're going to obey. No. This is chapter 20. This is chapter 24, chapter 32. They're worshiping a golden calf. They're breaking the covenant already. That sounds all great. I mean, this sounds worthy. I mean, in fact, we how many of you have ever said this? We've all been here, right? And we sing it, I surrender all. Have you ever, anybody ever heard that song? We change the words when we sing it here. <laughs> right, Noel? <Noah? laughs> because I surrender some. The, the reality is we don't. We make all these promises to God. I surrender all. Do I? <coughs> Even when I say that, I can think in my head about places I'm not surrendering. <laughs> Even, yeah, Karen's laughing because she knows. Yeah, Preston, we know. <laughs> yeah. We, tell, we say this to God all the time. Yes, this is exactly what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to live. Look at me. Just do it, right? We're always chasing after other gods, just like Israel. We're always chasing after more important things. So the exiles, they've seen, the ones that have been deported, they've seen Israel destroy, or they've seen Jerusalem destroyed. And they've been deported because they are promise breakers. They are promise breakers. And they have no way of fixing it themselves. There's no way. They can't go back. They can't undo it. In fact, if they were to have another Sinai moment where they're all gathering around, yep, we're going to do it. No, there's, there's no doing this. Because the same thing would happen again. What makes this section so great is that God's not going to abandon his people. In fact, the entire section that we just read begins with this the Lord creates something new that's the verse right ahead of the section that we just read I'm going to do something new. I'm going to do something different we aren't doing this again we aren't doing this again and so I am going to do something new these are words of promise. They're, they're among the greatest words of promise in all of Scripture. I mean, I get goosebumps every time I'm reading this stuff. Because God, in this moment, with these people who've been deported, who are undergoing intense suffering, who have all these questions, God is saying, you know what? Yes, you're a covenant breaker. I am not going to abandon you. I'm not. And he's going to do it. He's the initiator. Then he says, look, the days are coming. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And by the way, Israel and, Israel and Judah there, it's not going to just be the people in the southern kingdom. He's going to, bring it, he's going to make this thing all whole again. The whole, the whole shebang. The whole nation. Unlike the one Israel broke, I'm going to make a new covenant 
Now, we're going to talk just briefly about this word may, because it's hiding something in our translation. In fact, most of our English translations are doing this because we don't, we don't really understand the whole idea of covenant in our world. That literally means cut. Cut. Every place you see the word make or make a covenant in this paragraph, I'm going to cut a covenant. That sounds weird to us. When we sit down and we write contracts and do things between ourselves or we draw up, draft things, we don't talk about cutting a contract or cutting a covenant or cutting a promise. But they did. They did in those days. Now, covenant making of this kind, the covenant, kind of covenant making that results in a, something that is going to be brand new always happens with the shedding of blood. In fact, it doesn't happen if you don't have the shedding of blood. The, the writer, the New Testament writer is always going back to the idea God said it without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness that's this idea without the shedding of blood there is no covenant there's going to be something new but there's also going to be a death now it seems like a bizarre ritual to us we actually have an instance of this kind of cutting of a covenant in the old testament in genesis 15. god makes or god cuts a covenant with abraham that ceremony is depicted in Genesis where God does a ratification ceremony with Abraham. And this is, this is very tame. I guarantee you it didn't look like this. Because what it involved was, if you're going to cut a covenant with a party, you guys are going to make a promise. You guys are going to do a treaty, even, even treaties. Treaties were done this way. You cut up animals and you cut the animal in half. Half the animal goes to the left, the other half goes to the right, and you create a path between the two animals. And here they just kind of got the animals laying on their sides, right? This is just a, a nice geobated picture. But the reality is this is super bloody. And then both parties would walk through the middle of the animals. And what they're saying in cutting this covenant, cutting up the animals and cutting up the covenant, if I don't make good on the promises that I'm making in this covenant, whatever they are, and maybe it's buying a home, buying a piece of land, if I don't make good on this, may my life be like the lives of these animals. May my life be dead. These animals are dying in my place. This is what you can do to me if I don't make good. On these promises. So, you see what's happened to Israel? Israel has seen Jerusalem leveled. They've been deported. They are no longer a nation. They died because they're covenant breakers. Covenant breakers. One of the stunning things about cutting God cutting the covenant here with Abraham, by the way, God is represented in this story. Go back and read it. He's the, the torch in the fire pot. God himself, as he is cutting a covenant with Abraham, God himself walks through the middle of those animals. Abraham does it. In fact, he puts Abraham to sleep. There's only one person walking through those things. You know why God put Abraham to sleep? Because he knew there's no... Abraham's a covenant breaker. He's a sinner, like the rest of us. He knew there's no way that Abraham is ever going to be able to live up to all the expectations of this covenant. So God walks through the, the, the pieces of the animal by himself. This is something I'm going to do. I'm going to do this all alone. I don't need your help. In fact, you can't help me. I'm going to do this. And so here in Jeremiah 31, I'm going, to, I'm going to make a new covenant. This is something that you can't do. It's just going to be me. 
You are incapable of leaving, living up to any of the standards. You're incapable of fulfilling any of the characteristics, any of the terms of this covenant. So a new covenant is going to be cut. One that is unlike what they've had. Yes, this is a reenactment of Israel's history, but this time God is doing it all by himself. This one's going to be better. This one's going to be different. This one's going to be permanent. It's going to be unlike the covenant you broke. In fact, this covenant can't be broken. You can't break this covenant. It's going to be impossible for you to break it. And that's not all. There's more. So he starts laying out just exactly what this new covenant is going to give them. Remember how I said there's a bunch of characteristics and all? Well, there's a bunch of characteristics here. Again, this is the details of all the stuff that is new. I'll make a new covenant. I'm going to make an unbreakable covenant. He also says I'm going to put my teaching in the people. I'm going to rock my teaching on their hearts. They forget. I'm going to be their God. I will be their God. They will be my people. We're going to come back to that one. They will all know me. All right. I will forgive their iniquity and never remember their sin. All of that is part of this new covenant. This is staggering. Well, again, we're not going to go over all of these today. But all of these are off the charts new. A new covenant. This is Israel's future. The covenant's going to be unbreakable. They're going to know God. The teaching, he's going to put the teaching on their hearts and plant it in their hearts. A covenant that cannot be broken. A covenant that provides forgiveness. That old covenant couldn't provide forgiveness. And it's all going to be done once and for all. Now, if we were to read further in Jeremiah 31, which we're not, there's also one more piece of this covenant. There is going to be a descendant in this covenant. There's going to be a descendant. In fact, Isaiah, we skipped over this, but Isaiah actually brings this up when he's talking to his crowd, making some of the same promises. Isaiah says this, I'm going to make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And again, if you know the New Testament, you know who this is talking about. And then he says, God is saying, I'm going to appoint you to be a covenant for the people. That's a remarkable statement. You know why this covenant can't be broken? You know why this covenant is forever? You know why it's, it's perfect? You know why it's all new? You know why it's all blessing? Because it's a person. It's a person. A person who forgives and remembers sins no more. And this is exactly what Jesus has done. We use these words every week, reading from Matthew this time. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. This is my blood of the new covenant. This is me. I'm the covenant this time. I'm the promise. What makes it a covenant is a person. And this is a covenant that for all this forever. And the whole that comes down to that night when Jesus was betrayed. Holding that cup. You remember all those things that I were promised to Jeremiah that I promised. I did it. I've come here. I'm the covenant. I'm making a new covenant in my blood. You remember how I said that God himself is going to walk through the pieces? May my life be the one of the dead animals. Guess who dies in order for this new covenant to be possible? It's not Abraham. It's not Israel. It's Jesus himself. There's no more talk about breaking the covenant because Jesus dies. 
Jesus dies the death of the animals in the cutting ceremony. And he makes good on the other aspect or characteristic that is involved in relationship that's part of the Jeremiah 31 promise. I will be your God and you will be my people. Jesus establishes relationship. A relationship with us that cannot a relationship that is based on the forgiveness of sins. There is no breaking this relationship. This relationship then is your identity. We say this all the time, especially as we come to this table, that this table, what is going on here is your identity. You are a forgiven people. Forgiven people. So we come here as promise breakers and we leave here as promise keepers only because Jesus is the one who kept the promise for us. So we live in a world, we live in a world of broken promises. And we've, we've done it ourselves. We have. We've broken promises. There's anger, there's heartache, there's confusion, and it leads to this lack of trust. Well, this morning, these verses in Jeremiah are for you. <laughs> They're for me. You see, we are promise breakers. We live in a world of broken promises, and the question then becomes, who can you trust? Who can you trust? Who is it that you're going to trust? Jesus stands here and he raises his cup and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm the one that can be trusted. I am the someone who can be trusted. You know, the whole world the whole world can betray you. You know there's only, there is one person who will never betray you. It's Jesus. He gives you his promise. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares. Jesus can be trusted when the rest of the world cannot be trusted. There's one who is a guarantee. So when Jesus says, I promise, in fact, this, the writer of Hebrews says this, when Jesus says, I promise, he's not going to say, I swear on my mother's grave, I give you my word. <laughs> no, no, no. He's swearing by himself. He's swearing in his life and his death and his resurrection for us, and then he gives it to us. That's his promise. That's his guarantee. He's always good on his promise. He died and he rose to make it so. He is our promise. He's a promise for you. He's a promise for me. He's a promise for us. Let's pray.